Hello, everyone. Uh, today we'll be uh, looking at uh, technologies available to us for IoT applications that make use of existing uh, cellular mobile networks. Uh, my name is Abelino Romo. I am a software engineer by day and a tinker by night. I've been working with uh, LTE connected devices since probably 2015, mostly on the side and have used modems by uh, Sierra Wireless and Telit. Uh, I've stuck with Telit for the majority of my projects because it just works and uh, cost hasn't been too terrible. Alex McLean here uh, has actually lured me into the dark side and introduced me uh, to Nerves a few years back. Um, I actually learned uh, it the hard way by adding support to a Solid Run IMX8 board. I am a big fan of Solid Run uh, SOCs and their carrier boards for development. Um, and I, it's, I thought it was like perfect thing to do to learn Nerves and uh, also add support to that. I still haven't fully made that public, but it's in the works. And uh, today I'll be talking about uh, low bandwidth technologies uh, that I am excited about and uh, some of uh, the history and uh, surrounding components. So the technologies that we'll be focusing on today are uh, LTEM and NB-IoT. For um, which are both uh, uh, low power wide area network, LP1 uh, technologies, and they have a few overlapping characteristics. Um, they both have uh, extended range, uh, low power consumption, um, and reduced cost, mainly because the complexity uh, is much lower than traditional LTE modems. some terminology before we get too deep into the uh, weeds here. Um, MNO stands for uh, Mobile Network Operator in uh, North America region. Uh, typically, uh, our MNOs are uh, Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T. Um, MVNO stands for Mobile Virtual Network Operator, um, uh, which what they do is they buy resources off MNOs and uh, resell them in bulk. Uh, in North America region, some consumer MNOs are Cricket, Hello, and uh, Hello Mobile, to name a few. All right, LTEM or CAT um, M1. Like many LP uh, WAN technologies, these are there are two main uh, appealing benefits for IoT devices and applications, um, the extended range um, and very high power efficiency. With the extended range, uh, we get better indoor and uh, underground coverage um, and penetration since we gain uh, 18 decibels in coverage, um, uh, sometimes referred to as MCL or maximum uh, coupling loss, which means it can take, it can tolerate up to 18 decibels uh, higher signal loss along the uh, tr transmission path uh, compared to LTE. The increase in coverage allows the signal to better penetrate uh, tougher uh, construction materials such as concrete, uh, brick walls, and uh, perhaps even fire doors. Um, when it comes to uh, power consumption, LTEM introduces uh, two new modes, power saving mode and extended uh, discontinuous reception. In power saving mode, um, the device informs the network um, it is going to sleep indefinitely. Uh, this is a little bit scary because from what I've, what I've been told actually by Telet themselves, uh, was it Telet? No, I think it was Nordic. <laughs> um, uh, once in, in this mode, there is no mechanism uh, in, in the network to wake uh, the device remotely um so it, it's it's a little bit scary but uh it's the feature exists um excuse me for extended discontinuous reception uh this refers to the amount of time that will pass 
before the network will wake a device. For LTE, the default is 1.28 uh, seconds, and the default for LTEM um, is about five seconds. LTEM operates in band within the LTE spectrum. Um, it has full mobility, it can roam freely, and uh, the data rates are um, one megabits per second. Um, and uh, latency is around uh, 10 to 15 uh, milliseconds. NB-IoT, uh, otherwise known as narrowband, um, has slightly better range uh, than um, LTEM. Uh, mode of operation is uh, in-band, guard band, which exists uh, between, between or on the edges of existing LTE frequency bands, um, and standalone uh, on the uh, GSM spectrum that isn't occupied. When it comes to uh, mobility, uh, narrowband solutions are best for applications that don't require high mobility, uh, since there is uh, no cell handover. Um, as the device moves away from the cell tower, it is uh, that is that it's currently connected to. Uh, the data repetitions increase, uh, which causes uh, more power consumption, um, and uh, the modem will just continue to do that until it fully disconnects from that tower. At which point, it will reset itself and try to find the nearest tower. Uh, but because it can, because the distance between uh, the, the cell tower and the modem itself can be, you know, extremely large, um, the, the, the modem itself at that point could um, consume a lot of power. And uh, data rates is uh, sub 100 uh, kilobits per second, and latency is in the seconds of range. So, deployment. Uh, these technologies are deployed almost worldwide. There's gaps, as you guys can see. Um, uh, North America, we have both LTEM and narrowband available. Um, Mexico, uh, only LTEM. Um, and the uh, majority of the Asia continent is on narrowband. Yeah, as we can see, um, most of the Asian continent ha um, has uh, narrowband deployed. Um, and from what I've gathered, uh, LTEM was uh, deployed first in countries that already had um, the LTE technology, and uh, for countries that didn't, um, uh, it's m much uh, cost effective uh, to roll out a narrow band instead of rolling out the more complex uh, LTE network. Here we have a comparison chart. Uh, putting uh, your standard um, LTE CAT1 um, aside with uh, CAT M1 and a narrowband IoT. Um, the latency and uh, quality of service um, around uh, CAT and narrowband increases, um, but at the same time, there's this drawbacks. Uh, we have um, limited bandwidth on, on both sides of uh, CAT M1 and narrowband, um, but it's they're <laughs> they complement each other because of what we saw in the previous um, uh, deployment map, but. At the moment, we can't really use one or the other um, if we want to deploy something uh, globally. The cost of, of these modems isn't too bad either. Um, we're seeing anywhere from 10 to 20 uh, per uh, quantity one for CAT M1 and six to 10 for narrowband. Um, I was in a call with 
tell it. And they suggested that uh, for direct buyers, um, they and in high quantities, they can get as low as uh, ten dollars for their Cat M1 offering. Use cases. Uh, for LTEM, we have a broader range of IoT applications uh, because of higher bandwidth, um, uh, low latencies, and um, uh, the ability to roll out uh, devices um, uh, uh, in many countries. Um, and typical applications could be uh, wearables and automotive, uh, things that like to roam uh, and move around. For narrowband IoT, it's best if uh, the devices are kept stationary or they there is a plan to uh, move it so that you know the device itself doesn't incur uh, power uh, performance penalties. Um, and the low throughput also limits applications. Uh, we just can't um i don't know um implement a, a wearable using a, a narrow band because it's it's not going to perform where well only um if we look at uh the, the data rates by themselves so um good applications would be uh fixed sensors or smart meters um some have advocated for um uh applications in the security space, such as uh, security systems, but I don't believe in um, IoT and um, as, well connecting uh, security devices on, on uh, IoT networks or LTE networks. Um, I like my security wired. SIMS uh, and their uh, evolution. Um, SIM stands for uh, Subscriber Identity uh, Module. Uh, originally, uh, SIM cards were the size of credit cards. Uh, since then, um, they pretty much evolved uh, gradually um, to mini, micro, and uh, nano SIMs. SIMs are actually built on top of an existing technology called uh, UICC, which stands um, for a universal integrated circuit card. Um, since are smart cards that can consist of uh, MCUs, um, RAM storage, and uh, crypto capabilities, of course. SIM, eSIM, and iSIM. So in the previous one, uh, we saw plastic SIMs. Um, after plastic SIMs came uh, embedded uh, at SIMs. And uh, the form factors for uh, embedded uh, SIMs are MFF2 and iSIM. I'll get into uh, what that means in a bit. Um, but here we have SIM form factor uh, names. Uh, Mini SIM, for example, is called uh, 2FF, where FF simply stands for form factor. Uh, MFF2 is uh, the form factor uh, for embedded SIM. iSIM uh, move the embedded SIM into a secure enclave directly into the modem package. There are a few modems in the wild that I've seen that actually implement this. Um, I think uh, from what I've gathered, uh, there's one SKU in Telet and um, one in Sierra. I haven't looked thoroughly enough um, in uh, the Quecktail family um, to figure out if they have something, but uh, they do exist. So, uh, plastic sims versus embedded sims. Uh, which one do I use? Uh, plastic sims are perfectly um, fine for development. Um, I don't. I wouldn't like for a plastic sim to be deployed um, in in the wild uh, because someone could just go in there and. Um, pull out the SIM card and maybe, I don't know, pull it on their phone, start tinkering with it, and uh, I don't know, do nefarious things. Who knows? Um, for, 
for deployed uh, uh, products, I would definitely prefer uh, prefer the uh, embedded uh, going the embedded sim route. Um, essentially, MFF two is the more um, the solution that is more widely available. Now, I won't be using. I'm sure you guys have for, have heard the phrase eSIM. I won't be using uh, the name eSIM to describe the uh, GSMA EUICC spec, which we will get into that also, <laughs> um, because people often use eSIM to describe embedded SIM hardware also, which is what we're all talking about right now. Um, that is the solderable MFF2 form factor. It is possible to buy plastic or embedded SIMs that support updating via EUICC, which is what, for example, Apple calls eSIM or other uh, consumer products called eSIM. Um, it's also possible to buy plastic or embedded SIMs that can't be updated over the air. Uh, we'll get into what is EUICC shortly. MZ numbers. I, I, I'm pretty sure we've all seen them. They're uh, printed uh, usually in um, uh, plastic uh, SIM cards, uh, and it, they're usually referred to as um, SIM card numbers. Um, MZ stands for International Mobile Subscriber Identifier. Um, it is a string uh, with the following format, uh, mobility country code as the first two to three uh, digits, mobility network code as the first uh, two to three digits, uh, and the subscriber identity, something that um, identifies uh, the SIM. And it all, the entire MZ number, um, is um, a unique number that allows MNOs to authenticate us, the subscriber, um, onto the network. Um, and uh, usually with plastic SIMs or even um, embedded uh, SIMs that can't be updated over OTA, uh, they're provisioned by the MNO. One mobile IoT product deployed globally. I think that's what we all want. And uh, some of the challenges uh, that we encounter are cost, complexity, uh, and reliability of uh, roaming partners. Uh, when deploying a, a product globally, we the easiest thing to do is um, pick up various MNOs that operate in the regions that we're going to uh, deploy or sell our products in um, and build out uh, a SKU per region, essentially. Um, and during the manufacturing process, we'll assign um, the SIM card for that region uh, to that SKU and package and ship. So it it's unnecessary uh, complexity nowadays because we have more tools to um, get rid of that. But then uh, managing um, multiple MBNOs uh, and uh, billing and, and all that, it, it can get tedious. So what are our possible solutions here? It's very easy for us uh, to remove a SIM uh, from our mobile phones, but how do we uh, cater to many devices? How can we do the same uh, for multiple devices that are just um, deployed uh, around the world uh, without us having to go on the field? Uh, and we have uh, two options that we can use, multi mz and EUICC, which in the consumer space is referred to as eSIM. Uh, what is multi-MZ? 
MZ. Um, multi MZ is a single SIM card. You have one billing relationship with your with a single connectivity partner, um, and a simple one one shop to manage uh, billing and uh, sorry to manage uh, configuration um, and update profile profiles on the fly uh, for uh, those sims. So what does this all mean? So we've, we've gone through the various types of, of SIMs um, and what is an MC um, and, and how that is used for us to actually connect onto an M M MNO network. Um, with multiple MZs, uh, we can actually have multiple um, of those MZ profiles installed in a single uh, SIM card by either the um, connectivity partner or the MNO or MVNO for that matter. Um, and how it works deep down, um, typical uh, multi MZ uh, SIM cards will have uh, by default a bootstrapping um, uh, con connection profile, um, which it'll use uh, to connect to the network and uh, start to pull down um, either uh, MZ profiles that have been configured by um, the user of those devices um, so that uh, the device can pull them down and figure out which um, uh, APN or which um, uh, network to best connect to. There is another distinction that I want to make here um, with, for example, M MVNOs and M MNOs for that matter. Um, if like, for example, T-Mobile, I have a, a, a T-Mobile SIB on a product. Um, and that product is shipped across the world. Uh, T-Mobile has a roaming agreement with uh, multiple countries, uh, but with ro roaming agreements, we have um, uh, a cost increase uh, because we're going to get charged um, much more for data uh, when we're roaming versus if we're on the uh, foreign network. And that's what... Um, that's what we're doing here. With, with multiple MCs, we're essentially um, configuring a single SIM uh, with the capability of a foreign uh, MZ that can't connect directly to that MNO or MVNO in a foreign country um, and not incur any um, uh, roaming charges. There is much more to this. I am definitely glossing over a whole lot here um, and oversimplifying. Uh, what are some multi MZ risks? Um, orphaned devices in foreign countries, that could definitely be a thing. Um, if the relationship between uh, your network partner and the foreign MNO is severed, um, then there is just no way for that device to get back on that network phone home and perhaps get an updated uh, profile so that it can connect to another foreign network. EUICC stands for um, Embedded Universal Integrated Circuit Card, a standard uh, from GSMA in an attempt to solve the universal SIM problem. It allows devices to switch to a new network over the air, and it can hold many MNO profiles similar uh, to multi mc However, it's not as simple as multi mc since it requires a lot of supporting infrastructure, which must be certified also by uh, GSMA. So with uh, multi um solution, uh, there's really nothing new to it. It's just a basic SIM card. 
uh, since SIM cards are smart, smart cards um, and have uh, an MCU, they, it has some storage. That is how it's um, be able to uh, carry different profiles to be able to connect to different networks um, and, and also to update those profiles over the network. Uh, it's just reusing what already exists today in the LTE world. With EUICC, um, it's a whole nother ball game. Um, the standard, the spec itself um, is incredibly long. Uh, MNOs or MVNOs have to um, deploy services to support uh, this, the EUICC spec. Um, and pretty much a lot of a lot of work has to be done in order to actually deploy that. However, it's actually getting a lot of traction. I've encountered more EUICC um, network partners than multi MZ. I'll show a list later. So we talked about how um, plastic SIMs are provisioned. We talked about how multi MZ uh, are provisioned. Now let's talk a little bit about EUICC remote uh, provisioning. And um, like I said, the GSMA um, profile uh, switching spec is about 450 pages long. I'll be oversimplifying once again uh, things here, but as uh, you can see, the specs require um, a few services for remote profile uh, provisioning. If we consider these blue boxes uh, services, um, minus device and UICC, uh, but we'll be focusing on SMDP and SMSR. Uh, uh, SMDP uh, and SMSR represent uh, the subscription manager uh, service for the operator. Um, and this is a service that that MNO or that that MVNO supports, like it's, it's running in a data center somewhere. Um, SMDP is is <laughs> SMDP is uh, the subscription manager data preparation service. SMSR is, uh, stands for um, subscription manager secure routing. SMDP top box um, is responsible for generating personalized profile information uh, so that you can make use of them um, you have you can have them downloaded to your EUICC. Um, the secure routing is what our EUICC um, uh, chip interfaces with when uh, we want to download uh, a profile that was generated for us. Um, and the secure routing goes to uh, the data preparation service, retrieves the stuff, and passes um, them down to the EUICC of the other network. The EUICCs um, have uh, bootstrapping profiles, so your device will always be able to connect uh, to the mobile network, uh, phone home, and report that it's online, and wait for instructions to be able to pull profiles from the subscription manager. So I know this is a whole lot of information. <laughs> um, uh, the, the subscription manager is, is huge. Like that is what essentially uh, creates these MZ profiles on the fly for devices and shoots it over to the UICC um, if it's authorized to fetch them. And since the EUICC is either a smart card or an embedded SIM with flash, it just stores it. Uh, for it uh, to use later. Uh, EUICC risks. In, if the subscription manager service is down, devices will not be able to uh, receive profile updates from the MNO. 
if a device has already joined the network and acquired its initial set of profiles that we configured, um, it can still continue to operate by using the MZ profiles it has already stored in its pockets. Um, however, if I go in there and replace a profile um, and uh, the subscription manager happens to be down, then it simply won't be able to fetch the new profile. But like I said, it already has uh, profiles it can use to connect to whatever network it deems best uh, for the conditions it's in. Um, so it, it's fine. Uh, how, also, um, I previously I mentioned that um, GSMA um, has to uh, certify whoever implements all of this. It, it certifies every service. Uh, and the level of security, scrutiny, um, and redundancy required for the services uh, to, uh, to operate um, does not guarantee zero downtime, but it might simply mean really high availability. So five nines type, type of thing. So here's a list of some uh, MBNOs and EU ICC providers. Um, sorry, the main ones that I found um, that support uh, multi MZ is uh, Telet Connectivity, also known as. Actually, I don't know what the uh, marketing name is. Something Wise um, and Tulio. There, I, I'm not going to go and make recommendations here um, because I really haven't used any of them extensively. Uh, but I have been playing around with uh, Teal lately and uh, Truphone uh, with their plastic uh, EUICC sims. Um, I've played with uh, Twilio in the past, but not have not actually touch their multi MCs. I'm actually more curious uh, to get a hold of uh, multi MCs um, and, and test them out. Modules. Uh, for applications such as wearables uh, and um, sensors and whatnot, uh, we typically want to keep the cost low. They're the lowest uh, possible um, cost for a module will probably be for uh, narrowband uh, and BIOT. Um, but if we want to ship out a global uh, solution, uh, we can uh, use a um, dual solution. Uh, Tell it at the moment is uh, the one that actually has uh, some of these modems available on the market. Like I can go to DigiKey and buy an ME310G1. Um, I think DigiKey has it right now for around 20 bucks, but uh, I've heard, well, speaking directly to tell it, um, with bulk direct buys, I don't remember the exact quantity, uh, they can go as low as a $10 per module. There's another thing, um, and I'll touch on this uh, a little bit later, but there's another thing that I found very interesting uh, when I spoke with uh, tell it and teal. Um, so Teal was extremely helpful and uh, they mentioned um, all the certifications that we might uh, need uh, in order to uh, ship a product. Um, but Tellit for their offering basically said, oh yeah, y'all don't need to um, certify, uh, get any certifications with any of the carriers, um, it, it's fine. Um, I, don't, I don't trust that uh, because everywhere else that I've that I've seen and, and spoken to, um, while we we might not need to go through the full certification process for our product, we still need to do um, certification testing. Um, well, not not certification testing. Uh, I think it's compliance testing uh, with that carrier, which probably is cheaper. I don't know, um, but it has to be done. What about nerves? I've been going on about um, 
other tech here, but uh, what about nerves? So VintageNet has been a gift from uh, Frank, Matt, uh, Connor, and friends. Um, it handles uh, network configuration for allowing us mortals uh, to get started with roughly 10 lines of code. Um, uh, and that might look something like this. So configuring, configuring uh, VintageNet uh, QMI uh, might look something like this. Um, uh, this is actually what I'm using on one of my side projects, so I know it works. Um, but, but yeah, most uh, modern uh, cellular uh, modems uh, support Qualcomm's um, MSM interface and uh, should be used uh, for new projects. So, so if, if you're about to start a new project, uh, look up uh, vintage net qmi uh, because most likely uh for like i said for most uh, recent uh modems that are that are on the market uh it supports uh, uh qmi so the alternative to vintage net qmi would be um vintage net mobile which uses a uh, point to point uh, protocol to establish the connection That's not right. I had another slide. Sorry, I thought I had another slide in between. Um, a build root configuration uh, might look something like this. Uh, I believe for my specific use case, I had to add a few more um, uh, kernel configs uh, to enable uh, some other stuff, but I think it was unrelated to um, to the modem itself. So I think these four are safe. Gotchas. Okay, so something that I definitely ran across um, on some carrier boards uh, used for development, uh, we often need to power on uh, the PCIe interface. Uh, this can be manually done by writing directly to the correct GPIO pins, um, consult the data sheet uh, to see if that is required and what those pins might be, um, or via device tree uh, overlay. Uh, the Linux uh, kernel might also need patching depending on uh, which uh, Linux kernel version you're on. So for more modern uh, Linux kernel versions, um, the modem might be fully um, supported. I actually had to do for for this one actually for the solid run uh, carrier board. I since it's since I just used the um, uh, Linux kernel that uh, solid run provides. It's 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 a, actually a, um, older or ish one and uh, i had to manually patch uh, the linux kernel to add support uh, to the modem that i'm using uh, on this project and that is an le 910c4 um, but all that is usually found in the data sheet like i, I just went into the data sheet figured out uh, um, the diffs that uh, were required and um, added them as patch files into my uh, Nervous project and the thing just worked. It was, it was magic. I, I just love when things just work. Let's see, are we forgetting something? Ah, yes, certification. So device certification and testing um, uh, usually requires uh, getting certified by um, well, getting a few different uh, uh, certifications, but you don't need to go through carrier certification first before going uh, through SEC compliance first. So uh, the rec recommendation to me has been go through SEC compliance first, then worry about uh, carrier requirements. So if you want to roll out a global solution, there's essentially three uh, global certification forum, GCF, uh, PCS type certification review board, uh, usually uh, just referred to as PTCRB, and Verizon, uh, VCW. Uh, it can take up to two months, four to six 
weeks in general per certification. So use those numbers uh, for um, any wiggle room you might need to add for projects um, and also to align with clients maybe. Um, so while carrier certification is a little bit of a, a, a weird topic, some say, oh, yeah, it's not required. Some say, oh, yeah, it's required. Uh, but in the case of Verizon, it's definitely required if you don't have, uh, if your device is definitely not uh, certified um, and those uh, AMEIs are not registered, uh, Verizon is just not going to let you get on the network. Pricing, I feel like I am 100% wrong. But when um, I was uh, in conversations with Teal, um, they definitely men mentioned a range of numbers. But from what I remember in this conversation, it was like 700 in some cases and up to like $10,000 uh, for a single uh, uh, certification. I could be really off on those numbers and I'll make sure to figure out what those are and get that documented. But yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, that's it. Uh, and I'll open up uh, the floor for any questions. Uh, yeah, and this is Mark. Um, thank you very much. This has been very interesting. So when you're doing development, do you need uh, a data plan for each SIM card that you're using or testing with? Uh, in the case of um, multi MZ and um, EUICC, uh, you will need a SIM card for, for each device. But uh, under since everything's uh, getting pulled in a single uh, billing account, uh, you can just, uh, I don't know, add $10 for uh, all of the devices. And while it's not pooled data, it could be in some uh, by in some cases, uh, if the network partner operates in that fashion, it could be pooled money. Like they'll just uh, use um, uh, charge you for for what you use. Essentially, I know some um, uh, cellular partners uh, also charge per device. I. I have strong feelings about that. I, I don't like that, but um, some don't actually, and they just charge you for the data that you're using. Okay, thank you. This is kind of a question for the room, but has anyone tried putting nerves on a cell phone yet? So I have, silent is my answer. Uh, I've heard of people talk about it, but I've never seen the results. So like the, I think the Pine phone was the one that a few people got, but I don't know what ever happened to. I have a I have a question. So first, thank. Oh, so sorry to interrupt. If anyone else has an answer from the phone, I'm curious too. But uh, um, first, thank thank you for that this talk. I actually learned a few things too. Um, a bunch of things from the beginning. And one thing that I've been thinking about with Vintage Net QMI and Vintage Net Mobile is that they're kind of hard to get started with if you don't already have a cell modem. And I think a few of us have them as part of our work, but I haven't found a good one to a good accessible one, um, you know, using the examples or something to make it so that it works more out of the box with nerves. And I was just wondering if, if you had run across anything that looked particularly any more accessible to people or any, any recommendations in that area, if we wanted to improve the experience. So I typically, especially for development, I typically like to go with a carrier board that I know has a, a PCIe interface because you can definitely get um, a whole bunch of modems in uh, that form factor, um, which makes it really easy to swap out and you don't have to mess with uh, jumper wires or anything like that. Um, so uh, in terms of, of path of least resistance and less friction, um, recommending modems, it very much depends on uh, your um, your MCU, sorry, not your MCU, but but your your processor that you're that you're going with and your Linux version. That's that's going to be the, the limiting factor. But 
I will say that the LE910s are definitely, from Telet, are well supported in Linux. So those should definitely be uh, drop-in, um, easy to use uh, modems. And like I said, if, if, it's, if, they, if, if you can get one, which I know you definitely can in, in the PCIe form factor, and your dev kit has that plug and play. You might just need to turn on that PCI um, interface. <laughs> That's about it. I think I have one thing to add there too. I, Avalon, I don't know if this is what was missing possibly from one of your slides, but uh, being able to use a modem in one of the USB carrier boards. And uh, I found this pretty helpful for being able to separate out troubleshooting the modem and connectivity and all that stuff separate from the embedded system bits. Uh, so basically being able to use this to plug it into uh, just like a desktop Linux machine. And then it just shows up as a, a network interface essentially once you've got it working right. And this let me get on a different carrier's plan that I'd never used before and kind of like learn their system and all that stuff without having to figure out like, oh, is the problem that I didn't get the right drivers loaded into the system? Is the problem that I didn't get some one of the embedded bits configured or connected right? And um, it was, so it was a nice little troubleshooting tool, number one, but also just a nice like tool to have also if you just need to get that connectivity into, um, you know, into a desktop, into a laptop, something like that. 100% agreed. Oh, Avelino, did you ever um, go over the difference of like, what's the difference between QMI versus like the other solutions? Because there's two vintage nets out there, vintage net QMI and vintage net mobile. And you mentioned the QMI one, but then like, when do you use the other one? When do you use vintage net mobile? So I, I did touch on that lightly and mentioned that if if it's a new project, I would just opt for using QMI uh, because there's definitely modems that uh, all mo most modern modems uh, support uh, the Qualcomm's um, SMS interface. Um, so it's overall the experience there is is going to be better. So. Vintage Net uh, Mobile uses point-to-point -point, uh, protocol to establish uh, the connection, um, which sometimes requires um, ad scripts uh, to start that phone call. Um, and I've had more headaches and problems going the direct uh, uh, PPP uh, pathway, um, especially like uh, just straight up testing on uh, Ubuntu VMs and stuff like that. Um, I haven't actually tried it with nerves at all, so I can't say that uh, frictions exist there. They, they might not, it might just work. But one good um, reason for Vintage and Mobile is if you're simply, uh, uh, using an old modem uh, for whatever reason, maybe you're updating an existing product um, and you need to stay within um, the same family or within this various versions of the, the product line, um, which might just be a, a, an older-ish um, uh, modem. Uh, and it's probably just going to work with Vintage Net Mobile. Uh, another thing... Sorry, lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, if somebody just wanted to start playing around with cellular connectivity um, to like dip their toe in the water, what would you recommend for that? So in, in my experience, um, like I said, I've mainly used uh, for side projects, uh, Telet and Sierra Wireless. I've The least frictions that I've had um, have been with tel Telet modems they just work um, and they're for development um, they're pretty inexpensive maybe like 20 30 bucks um, and like you said get yourself a uh, usb to pcie dongle or if your carrier board has a pcie uh, mini pcie uh, interface uh, use that um, the the dongle idea was is terrific actually by the way like it most uh, um, uh, Dev kits, dev boards have USB on them, right? Raspberry Pis and whatnot, BeagleBone. So it's it's probably like the easiest thing to do if you want to get started um, with development on day one. Cool. Yeah, and this uh, board was like another twenty or thirty bucks, something like that, off Amazon. So basically, if you've already got like a BeagleBone or a Raspberry Pi or something with that USB port on it, then basically for less than a hundred bucks, you could get in the door playing around with uh, cellular, if I've got that right. 
Well, if no one else has any questions, this sounds like a good place to uh, wrap up the presentation then. And uh, thank you very much, Avalino.